What's up, everyone? This is David, a.k.a. Reverse Long, and I'm here with Gerard Michaels. Um, Gerard and I, we did a podcast uh, not too long ago about Twitter and crypto crashing and things like that, some general topics that are interesting. You know, I like to, I reached out to Gerard um, because I I found him on the Value, Value Tainment and the PVD podcast when he was on there. And he has his own podcast now that called the Slick and Thick Podcast with Mickey Gall, a UFC fighter. And um, he also has a background in like uh, filmmaking. He's a comedian. He's a, he's a former minor league baseball player, um, all this stuff. And, it, you know, Gerard, like, I always like to hear what he has to say. He has some really interesting thoughts on, like, the overall, on the world overall. So, like, um, when, when um, the Twitter thing happened recently, they finally, t- Elon Musk, Elon Musk closed the deal um, after the whole saga of the lawsuits and all that. Um, I thought, okay, let's let me reach out to Gerard one more time because we, we went over this in the beginning when, when it was a possibility of, of Elon acquiring it. And, uh, you know, there's some issues there with freedom of speech and social media. And now we have TikTok, which is going to be an interesting uh, thing to, you know, see how that plays out. So who better than to get a, you know, uh, insight on this than Gerard, you know? So what's up, Gerard? How are you doing? Man, I appreciate it, man. Uh, yeah. And uh, happy to be with you, man. Love your podcast. Love your show. Thanks for having me on. And uh, Elon, huh? Um now, here's the thing, okay? I know a lot of people, especially in my circles, the libertarian circles and, and the, the, the places, you know, that really are anti-censorship, are pro-free speech, uh, very excited by this. But um, I can be cautiously optimistic at most, and I'm a little cynical at the moment. Um, it, the, a lot of window dressing. He's tweeting and he's trolling and that stuff's really, really good. But has any of the major characters been brought back off their suspensions? No. Uh, he still, he, it took him three days to kowtow to the, the woke, you know, anti-defamation leagues and, you know, the, these the activist groups that, that, you know, act as, you know, their own mafias, basically, and shakedowns. He kept Yoel Roth. For people that don't know, Yoel Roth is, uh, the, he's the head of content moderation, and he has been for years. So out of all the people that, um, look, there was a great deal of schadenfreude uh, for for the people that were fired, especially, I forget her name, the the female lawyer who, you know, hates free speech. So like seeing these people get fired and then for cause, so they're not going to get their millions of dollars. There's a certain level of like, yeah, suck it, that, that we all want, right? There's a certain level. We're all just like, man, we're desperate for some sort of accountability, like somebody for everything that's happened in society over the last two years, like somebody be held accountable for it, right? So I get that. But tangibly, what differences are, are should we expect in Twitter outside of being probably much more efficient, much better ran, and for Vine to come back to compete with, as you said, TikTok? Because, you know, video is not the future, it's the present. So, so yeah, so initially I saw that he's going to start charging for verification. So like now he's going to try to make some money off of it, which th- that's been a problem with Twitter. But like you said, you know, um, the whole banning thing, like he's still keeping a lot of like whoever was banned is still remaining banned. So like that's still like, what, it, what do you think he's going to do with that? What any, any thoughts on like the route he goes? Cause like, you know, yeah. um, yeah, it, it was out of control you know, before he took over and like nothing's changed so far. And he hasn't really, I don't know, I haven't really heard much uh, about any drastic changes as far as that's concerned yet. So what, what do you think is his, is his move? Well, I, I think uh, it depends on the midterms, frankly, because <laughs> uh, the number one thing that came out of his acquisition is that the DHS, the Department of Homeland Security, was working uh, as a propaganda arm of the White House. And was working directly with these social media companies, Facebook, uh, Twitter. They actually had a portal made specifically for them to submit. It could have been you. It could have been me. So the Department of Homeland Security, instead of, you know, you know, (laughs) marking the world's terrorists and and making sure that we're we're safe from from, you know, real threats to our democracy. That's all we hear about threat to our democracy. uh, They're submitting people who are showing skepticism with vaccine mandates and with school lockdowns and 
you know, with everything that happened, all of the policies for the last two years, the Department of Homeland Security is policing the opinions of their own citizens via these social media networks. Why this isn't, this is one of the biggest stories of all time. This is a clear First Amendment violation. This, to me, is grounds to break up the DHS. Um, why that isn't a massive story, I think we all know, because, you know, there's no separation between state and media now at this point. And uh, if, if Elon's acquisition only shows us that, that that actually happened, then it's enough. Uh, and then what ends up happening here with the midterms, who knows? Uh, because, again, it's so similar to this this idea that Elon's going to come in and, and save us. Um, if people think this red wave is coming and all these Republicans are going to come into office and all of a sudden hold the FBI accountable and the IRS accountable and DHS accountable, I got to tell you, as somebody that worked in politics, it's not the way it works. What they're going to do is they're going to go in and they're going to be like, hey, you know how you used all this stuff against me? Well, I'm in power now. It's... Um, have you ever seen the Lord of the Rings with the ring of power? Yeah. Yeah. And, and in the very beginning, they're like, cast it into the fire, destroy it. And yeah. The, and the power is like, no. And he puts it on. Yeah. I think Republicans are going to do, I don't think that they're going to do the right thing. I think that they're going to take the power of this government that's been abused and corrupted and used against its citizenry. And I think they're going to turn it on their political opponents. Um, and it's not, it's going to be the other half. They're going to get abused. And are going to feel, you know, ostracized and, and oppressed and repressed because they will be. And what will be interesting when it happens is they'll look for sympathy and they'll get none from us. So I, I don't know. Um, you know, I, <laughs> I hope I hope your audience doesn't come here for good news and positive outlook because, you know, uh, I, I just I think at this point. Anybody who expects something, somebody to do the right thing because it's the right thing to do hasn't been paying attention to where this moment in time. Um, I, I think that uh, there has to be dire consequences for the powerful to be held accountable. Otherwise, they just simply won't do it. Um, and as far as the, the $8 is concerned, $8 a month, like – it just goes to show you, especially somebody like AOC, who's supposed to be a, a person for the people. Verification is just supposed to mean that you are who you say you are. It's all it's supposed to mean. But it turned into this modern aristocracy where there was, you know, the bourgeois and the peasants, you know, and and they don't they don't want to lose that. You know, they they are so many people who have made their entire personality, their entire lives about that blue check. And they literally think it makes them better than other people. They, they think it makes their opinion worth more. Uh, and they don't want, you know, us plebs to, to, to be able to be seen and heard. Um, I mean, really, when you talk about the, the outreach, you know, $8 a month to be able to spread your message to millions of people. I mean, that's remarkably cheap. That's insane. He could charge $8,000 a month. For if you were a company or a publishing outlet, there's no reason the New York Times shouldn't be paying ten thousand, fifteen thousand dollars a month for the priority position that they have in the news, right? So, yeah. go ahead. Oh yeah, I was just confused. Like when I read that too, I was like, okay, like you said, it's like uh, the bourgeois and the peasants. It's like okay, so blue check mark these days. The way I interpreted it. Um, is is like a status symbol. It's like a social status, and oh, and, and and credibility or whatever. And um, and 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 like for for anybody to be able to verify who they are, it it kind of filters like the bots, right? The the whole problem with the bots, and it kind of equalizes the playing field as far as like the bourgeois and the peasants, you know. So it's just uh confusing how like i saw yeah i see like aoc is complaining about that you know so the <laughs> uh, people to be seen or heard it's, it's almost you know you know david it's, it's it's almost like aoc is completely full of shit almost it's almost <laughs> yeah i'll say she is full of shit <laughs> you know so um anti-capitalist selling 60 dollar fucking print t <laughs> Yeah, that's right. She has the whole sweater uh, that says AOC. She sells it for sixty dollars, she, and she's complaining about the eight dollar uh, blue check mark that equalizes the playing field instead of having um, the blue check mark only going to the upper 
status people, you know, like celebrities or millionaires. Misrepresenting, they're misrepresenting uh, that everybody's going to have to pay eight dollars. No, there's you're, it's a freemium model. Basically, you're still going to be able to use Twitter for free. You just won't be verified, and you won't have the benefits of verification. So, yeah, man. And, and what's crazy, I don't know uh, if it's just me, but I, I've been talking with some other people. I, I hate this term, and like the influencer marketplace. And um, man, Facebook and Instagram are insane right now. Like the reach is down so low for us. Like we've been turned down to nothing. Like they don't want us talking before the midterms. <laughs> and all I'm not seeing anybody in the feed that I follow. It's all these suggested posts. You might like this. And it's like John Fetterman. And I'm like, what in the world would make you think I want this? I need to see the algorithm that makes you think I want to see this. You know, it's like it's like straight Soviet era propaganda. Uh, so and I, but the thing is, I think we're all learning is like we human beings, well, half of us, right? We're kind of splitting into groups. There's people that have this natural bullshit meter where we're like, I don't know, man, this this seems fishy. I feel like you're trying to manipulate me and we reject it. And then there's other people that just go along with the flow, whatever, whatever it says. Like, hey, you know, I mean, there, there's people right now that are, you know, you know, trying to trying to tell us that Doge is going to a dollar because, you know, Elon's going to do uh, all the eight dollars in Doge. And it's like, and let it all right let it ride bro like let it let it get can it get the 15 cents first <laughs> like you know last time we did this thing it was what do they get up to 47 cents and i go back down to three cents i mean dude like it's a pump and dump like I, it could have whatever utility it wants to have you can make whatever argument but don't tell me it's not a pump and dump you know like the manipulation just drives me out of my mind like it's like, come on oh it has this unbelievable utility okay whatever I'm not going to read the white sheet, I, I, the white paper. I don't. I wouldn't know what I was looking at if I did, right? I'm going to try to get in, you know, if, it, if it's at 13, I'm going to try to get in and get out when it's 16. And then I'm going to half it up to 18. And then I'm going to half it up to 21. Like, you know what I'm saying? Like, oops, that's it. I got I got deplatformed. Uh, yeah, so in these uncertain times, man, I, I just think anybody who's not skeptical, and anybody who's not a little bit cynical, you just haven't been paying attention. You know, I mean, how many lies does your government have to tell you? How many, how, how many things do we have to be shown to be straight up manipulation by our government? People that, that you know, you know, we, we entrust with, with our protection before we're like, all right, show your work, you know? So when it comes to Elon Musk, I, I would say, again, cautiously optimistic. But until something good happens, I wouldn't anticipate it. Yoel Roth still being there is a massive red flag. Yeah, I, I tend to agree with you on that. Like, cautiously optimistic is a good way to approach it, I think. Yeah, you know, but it, initially, I think it is a, it has potential, you know, the more potential than before. <laughs> Because well there's, uh, well, there's no well, there's no doubting it was being mismanaged, right? I mean, it was it was essentially there to be a tool for, you know, mass propaganda. It was a propaganda arm of China and far left governments worldwide, the World Economic Forum. It's a massive propaganda arm, you know, and that's what it was. It wasn't a free market. It wasn't a free market of of, of speech. There's completely different algorithms. There's completely different reach depending on what your opinion is. Um, so. Yeah, I, I mean, it, it was it was mass. Uh, well, what's the term? Mass formation psychosis. It was just a propaganda mill, man. And all those bots and stuff like that. What I I think that we can absolutely look forward to is this thing being well run. This thing being made to to profitable. If there's anything Elon Musk knows how to do, it's how to structure and maintain and execute a business model. I think Vine's going to make a comeback. Uh, I, I would be shocked if there wasn't, um, you know, some sort of tiered subscription model, you know, for advertising, where you'd be able to advertise on specific people's pages and stuff like that. They've all been trying to do that. But that's like, that's the hardest thing in the world for influencers is to like find advertising and like where what your content does. Like why, like, you know, the worst content creators in the world 
have 10 million views on every you know video because it's like children making dinner with putty and it's like that's the only thing that's universally advertiser friendly but what they should do is create a portal an advertiser portal that says you know what this guy jake paul he's got you know 15 million subs but he curses and he does wild stuff so you know our contract with Procter and Gamble isn't going to work. Procter and Gamble gives us a hundred million dollars a year to advertise their, their craft products and their, you know, Colgate toothpaste. But, you know, you said something that makes you ineligible for that monetization. That doesn't mean that those 10 million views that you get don't have value. It means that they don't have value for crest white strips, but they should have a portal specifically for an advertiser to go and be like, Hey, I want my brand to be, the commercial you see before every Jake Paul uh, vine. And I think Elon Musk will do something like that where they'll do like open bids, you know, for somebody that, you know, imagine having like a, a trading card company, you know, like you got these trading cards that sell for like 50 grand, you know, wouldn't you want to, wouldn't you want to be the first person on before every sports center or something like that. Right. So I think that, that, you know, creating a, a marketplace where, where niche brands can, match up with influencers uh, and then do a revenue share with those influencers is a huge way, a huge way that they can make money, huge way that they can make money. And I can see him doing something like that. And that, that would, you know, in order to get into that portal, you got to pay $8 a month and then you can make 10 grand a month doing unboxing. Who, who doesn't want to do that? And Elon's getting it on both ends then pretty good deal. Yeah. Very, very interesting take with all that, man. Thanks for giving, for giving that, that, uh, all that background okay so um what about your thoughts on tiktok mm -hmm. what about it? um do you think it's, it's gonna get banned or you know like why didn't it get banned before and like all of a sudden now people are talking about they want you know it's it's starting to come to the forefront of getting banned and before you know trump was a bad guy for saying he was hating on china for wanting to ban it and now now it's like it needs to be banned and, and people are worried about it and <laughs> so what do you think Here's the thing. Nobody gives a shit about their, their personal data. That's the bottom line. I mean, no, there's no, nobody gives a shit. I mean, no matter how many times you can tell somebody your, your cell phone is spying on you, the, your cell phone spying on you. Every time you open that app, it's going through your browser history. Every time you, you click that captcha, it's, you're, you're telling this, this bot to go through everything that you've looked at for the last hundred days, you, you know, you're, you're telling everybody you've, you've called how long the phone calls were like, you know, they know everything about you within a nanosecond after you click and everybody knows that and nobody gives a shit. So it, is it is it a proxy for the Chinese government, the CCP, the Chinese communist government to spy on American citizens and to propagandize them? Absolutely. But is it incredibly addictive? <laughs> Do people love it? I love it. I sit on there. I watch people cook steaks for like two hours. I'm like, I'm going to go on TikTok for like 15 minutes before bed. Next thing I know, it's two o'clock in the morning. And I've been watching some idiot in the in the, in the the woods cook a steak over a river. <laughs> like, you know, they, they, the algorithm is the same. It finds exactly what you like and it just keeps feeding you and feeding you. But what it, it shows for my industry is that we really need to start embracing micro content. Everything we do is long form. We keep trying to make these 10 episode series. We keep trying to make these two, three hour movies, these two hour podcasts. We need to readjust our thinking and we need to start making micro content, five minute podcast, make a hundred five minute podcast, make, you know, get into the space of very, very fast, concise, easily digestible entertainment, because that, that I think is, is the future of the marketplace. Now, here are my thoughts on that, man. Uh, and I'd like to get your thoughts on this because I, I thought I'm, I'm just like weird. So like I signed up for TikTok. I tried it out and I just wanted to see like my friends on there, but it didn't let me do that. It just kept feeding me random stuff to see what I like. And it felt like like an overdose. I was like, wait, uh, it's too much. Like, uh, and I just deleted it. I couldn't deal with it. it just <laughs> one year old's twerking. I, I can't handle it. <laughs> <laughs> but it's, it's like it's like crack, you know, yeah. it's like. So like, uh, but if you know it's crack, like, why do you know? It's like you're still, like you said, you want to do it for 15 minutes and you end up there two hours, like nonstop. 
Totally. There's actually a study. I got to I gotta try to remember what the study was. So I, I, you guys are just going to have to trust me on this one. Otherwise, I'm going to be talking out of my ass. But they, they check the dopamine levels of people who do cocaine, people who play video games, and people who go on social media. And the dopamine spike is, like, exactly the same. So the people who, like, argue politics with people on social media get the same dopamine spike as if they're doing a line of coke. The same thing as if they're, like, killing people in GTA or Call of Duty. There's There's something... There's something in our brain that they've figured out and they're hardwiring to because, you know, they, they're like, oh, they're going to like this. And it's that same addictive uh, principle. Um, the gamification of a lot of this stuff actually gets its uh, start from casinos and online gaming. So the bright colors, the, the noises, the dings and stuff like that, they gamify this stuff. You know, people want to see, you know oh my did my video get likes and when the likes come up you get these little floating hearts and there's a sound that's straight from slots that's that's just casino that's online gaming so they're gamifying this stuff so you're getting that gamification it's interesting content and then you get the dopamine spike yeah it's it's a literal addiction there and it's being designed to be that so you know uh but at the same time it's a tool man it's a tool so yeah you know, in, in the TikTok, in your case, there's two different things. There's, there's, you got to go to like your followers and then feed. It's two different things, but they don't make it very easy to, uh, to see. Um, but it, uh, short form video content is, is going to be everything. Short form video content, it doesn't matter if it's Instagram, Facebook. Um, you know, this is where the metaverse screwed up. I mean, this guy spent, tens of billions of dollars to create this massive online thing and it takes the number one thing is with the metaverse is it takes like three minutes to get into a room where you find anybody who's doing anything that's two and a half minutes too long that's three tiktok videos ago the the, yeah. the immediacy of it is not there um it's the same thing with with you know the what they were able to figure out with uh video games like remember back in the day there would be these like loading screens and you you, you know after a game was over You'd go into the lobby, and the lobby would be there, and you'd have to wait like five minutes for people to come. They got rid of all that because they realized that's when everybody was leaving. It's like the awkward pause in a the conversation. There's no, if there's no awkward pause, nobody leaves the, the party, you know. So it's yeah. they got rid of the pauses, you know. Um, you know, and I, I really, again, like everybody wants Twitter to be free, but if 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 it's it's the old rule, right, David? If if you're getting something for free, it's not the product. You're the product, right? Yeah. Nothing. There's no such thing as a free lunch. So, you know, it. I just don't think anybody cares that their data is being used. I mean, how much information do we need? So, I mean, is the fact that the data is being used by the Chinese communist government uh, enough to make people say no, as opposed to, you know, BlackRock or Bank of America or or you know, one of these other massive corporations. I, I don't, I, I really don't think people know about it or care about it. And I definitely don't think people under 21 give a shit. So, you know, I, I, I don't, I don't think that this is a, uh, I, I don't think that this is a short play. I think this stuff's going to be around for, for, for the rest of humanity. Gotcha. Well, Gerard, hey, thanks for all those thoughts and interesting observations and putting all that together. Um, yeah, I'm pretty sure a lot of people will get a lot of value from all that and a lot to think about right there with all this you know, uh, stuff. You know what will end up when it becomes a drag? When every other person on there is trying to sell you something. That, that, that'll that be the end of it. When every other person on there is trying to sell you a get-rich-quick scheme or a pyramid scheme or life coach you, when every other person is trying to sell something, that's, that's when it'll be over. It's going to be too much. Yeah, yeah. That'll be the, the blow-off top right there. That'll um, be it. Cool. All right, Gerard. Well, um, we'll keep in touch. And thanks for coming on the podcast. Really appreciate it. Thanks for having me, David, man. Check out uh, Slick and Thick Guys if you can on YouTube. And uh, yeah, come see one of my shows. I got two more shows this year. Follow me on Instagram at Gerard uh, DGAF and uh, all the other places. Appreciate you guys. Awesome. I'll have that all in the notes. Thanks, Gerard. I'll see you later. Bye. Later.